Welcome, everyone. I'm David Fearon, Duran Fellow and long, long, long time student of the Duran system. I want to tell you two things about this webinar that I've learned. The Duran framework gets better every year, and so does Joe DeFeo, our presenter. And there's a connection there. This is tried, true, tested, retested, and constantly revised thinking about how to, to reach a level of excellence in all manner of performance. So today we're focused on building a culture of excellence. This is part four of the series, and we're focusing today on the world famous Duran framework. During this webinar, please ask questions using the question tool. I'll keep an eye on them. If we can't get to them right in the middle of Joe's presentation, we'll address them at the end. This will run roughly 30 to 35 minutes. So with that, I welcome you and Joe, it's all yours. Hi, thank you, Dave, and welcome everyone from wherever you are. Uh, we are in part four of Building a Culture of Excellence series. Today's topic is the Duran Framework. And this uh, framework goes by many names uh, in many organizations. But um, I'd like to start off by just giving you a quote from Aristotle that uh, being excellent isn't just about doing the same things uh, over and over again. Uh, we need to do them over and over again, but we need to create a habit of excellence, not just do excellent things. And so, according to Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do, which is what we consider to be work. And excellence, therefore, is not an act, but is a habit. And many organizations, uh, we've learned bad habits, sloppy habits, undisciplined habits. And so, as your organization talks about being the quality leader, uh, or the benchmark or the best practice or the world-class leader, excellence is a habit that you must get used to. And in today's session, we're going to talk about uh, how we can improve your habits, basically by understanding what it takes, uh, as the series has pointed out, what it takes to build a culture of excellence. Uh, whether you're in advanced stages, new stages, or no stage, uh, the goal of our series is to provide you with a um, pragmatic, tried and true way of how to improve performance and how to get to that point of excellence. And unfortunately, with uh, new workplace initiatives coming and going like waves, uh, there's some workforce sadness versus happiness. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, understanding how to create excellence uh, will also bring happiness to both your customers and the employees. Now, uh, if you have just begun today by joining our series, uh, you may have missed out on the first three sessions, which we focused on the overall purpose of building a culture of excellence. We followed that up with a discussion of the benefits and results, in other words, why you would even do it. Uh, and the third one is the Duran model, which are the Duran principles that uh, we tend to recommend to our clients. Uh, Dr. Duran may have called them the lessons learned or universal uh, processes that everyone must learn. And today, it's about that framework. How do you build your house of excellence? Uh, the following three uh, series, or the following three parts of this series, we will go into more depth on the foundation, the enablers, and of course, the roadmap. Uh, we do stream this live, and you are welcome to send in questions, and Dr. Furon will alert me, and uh, we'll talk about the response to those questions. But we also will send you a link that will provide you a, a record of this. And if you missed some of the earlier ones and want to complete the series, you can go to our webinars page. Uh, so please do that. So the Duran framework, in this session, we're gonna review our framework or our house of quality for excellence. And the roadmap to launch or modify your journey will come in the last session. Uh, so what we're gonna to try to do is talk about uh, you know, how to build that system. 
And one way to think about that is if you're trying to build your dream organization through culture of excellence, what will it take? And many of us talk about excellence. Uh, if you're an old guy like me and you go back to the 80s when we had In Search of Excellence, a famous book by Tom Peters, uh, followed by the, uh, in the United States, the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award, followed by the European Award and many awards around the country and around the world. Uh, building an organization based on superiority and quality has led us to now looking at that organization as being not just quality focused, but business excellence focused. So how can we do that? And we presented, and I just want to um, emphasize again, that these guiding principles, Dr. Duran called that the model for excellence. Uh, if you're familiar with the Shingo model, they also have principles of excellence and many others, but this is what we espouse here, that there are universal principles that once you understand them in the organization and apply them, they apply to all process, all products, all services. And those universal principles are things like the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, project by project improvement, quality by design, continuous improvement. Uh, but those principles can be applied to cost reduction. They can be applied to implementing something new, but they work best when you apply them to really drive customer satisfaction and improve the customer experience. In other words, decide that the organization is going to be there to satisfy its customers beyond the norm and be that excellent company for your customers. Now, they also don't just linger out there and you get them to happen. You have to build a system to make them happen. You have to have infrastructure, teams, people, training. And you also have to have methods. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to achieve anything really breakthrough. And then you have to apply them to the processes and departments that can help us drive customer experience and get to that culture of excellence. And of course, uh, we need leadership and workforce involvement and engagement. And so if you like or dislike this model, then you're on your way to thinking about excellence. If you want to change some words to make them apply to yourself, the important part here is to communicate effectively with your employees and anyone else that's important to your ecosystem what you stand for with regard to excellence. Now, once you understand what you stand for, then you have to make it happen. So right now, I'm just going to show you the big picture of the Duran framework. In other words, it looks like a house, and we're going to build that house one step at a time. And we have a strong foundation. We have enablers. We have results. And then we sustain them over time. So what we want to do in this session is kind of build this house and explain why we're doing it that way, and also you build a house in a certain order. So we're going to begin by taking a look at how you might build your own dream home. And if you haven't ever built a dream home, you could start right now. So in order to build your dream home, we first have a decision to make. And that decision is based on what we can afford, where we want to live, the type of house we are going to have, etc. And so we create the plans, we get the drawings, we have some pictures, and voila, we have our plan to build our dream home. And once we clear the land and we're all set to go, what do we do? Well, you begin with a strong foundation. And so what's going to hold this home up over time? So if you've never built a home, you typically start with a footing below frost level, filled with concrete, and then your foundation is concrete or brick or blocks, and then the house sits on top of that. So building a strong foundation is going to give you the strength you need to support the house. And as you build each floor, each floor is going to get you to the conclusion, and each floor has its purpose. The first floor might be your kitchen, your living area, your dining area. Your first floor might be uh, 
an extended kitchen and and just a dining area. It might be even larger if you live in a mansion. But the first floor is usually the place where people are coming in from the outside and coming and going. And it's a very important floor because it's the first thing people tend to see. But as each floor is built, you're also starting to think about the end result. Where are we going here? We're almost done. We got to start thinking about uh, how it's going to look inside the house now that the house is being built. And so we start thinking about decorations and light fixtures and things like that. Focusing on results will help us get to our dream home. And eventually we get that roof on and that roof is there to keep off the rain, keep off the weather, keep off the heat and protect our home. In other words, it sustains the results of the building process that we have just gone through. Now, if you've never gotten to build a dream home, then one day you will, but I think you get the picture. You don't start at the top, you don't start at the middle, you start at the bottom. So if we really wanna build our dream organization, one that's based on excellence, and you're already in an organization, well, you can't just start over again. So you have to start thinking about the organization just like your home. It begins by understanding the foundation. And so if you're an organization that is focused on mediocrity, uh, satisfying the customers to a level, but not really pressing them, uh, always trying to improve performance, but based on cost and driving cost out, then you might have to really get leadership to say, what do we really want to be? And so the most important thing in your foundation is a strategic choice to be the best. And I don't mean be the best at cost reduction or be the best at just delivery or be the best at employee happiness. It means be the best in the eyes of the marketplace in your area of expertise. It means being the best in the eyes of your customers. They like your product, their service, and their entire experience. Whether you're a mom and pop grocery store or whether you're an Amazon or a Google or a hospital or an insurance company or a government agency. The choice to be the best is just that. It is a choice. But by articulating from leadership's position that we want to be the best, it enables us to then build our house based on what we need to do to become the best. Without that foundation to be the best, your organization is typically going to be left with piecemealing the house. One day we have this program, next day we have that program. One day we want to be good, the next day we want to be cheap. Another day we want to be this, another day we want to be that. And so once we make the choice to be the best, it's going to send in motion our decision to do something different. And when we mean something different, we have to create some new structure. That structure, or what we call an infrastructure, enables us to navigate through the current organization we have now. Our organizations are typically built hierarchically, or by product line, or by customer segmentation, or by geography. And we have processes that we work on every day that enables us to deliver some level of support. However, most of that level of support to the customer or to the business uh, comes with excess baggage like rework, redoing, too much inspection, too much audit, too much assessment, too many labor hours, too much inventory. And so in order to attack that stuff and make it better, we need to create a means to work better together. Uh, in the next, math, in the next uh, session, session five, we're going to delve into the depth of this infrastructure and foundational issues. But safe to say right now that supportive infrastructure means leadership is going to set up the proper governance, the proper steering or quality council that is going to help focus on the most important aspect of driving your culture of excellence, and that is customer satisfaction and removal of dissatisfaction. It also means learning new methods and better ways to deal with inefficiency and ineffectiveness in terms of customer dissatisfaction. 
Also, when you come up with a new method like Lean or Six Sigma or ISO or quality by design or design thinking uh, or uh, a Scrum or a Kanban or operational excellence, those come with methods and tools. And so we don't just learn the methods such as Six Sigma or Kanban or world-class excellence. We also then have tools like statistical analysis, statistical process control, Pareto, cause and effect, uh, the means to do root cause analysis. And the organization starts to measure things differently than they did before. Many organizations, their metrics are set up to tell us how good we are. When you start thinking about the choice to be excellent, you not only want to know how good you are, but it's a target that keeps moving and you want to know where you are according to that target. It's best to know what you aren't rather than what you are when it comes to improvement because that will keep driving you higher and higher. So we begin to look at metrics in a different way and we begin to look at metrics in the eyes of the customer. So we look at more things that are uh, delivery times, accurate delivery, or prompt levels of service, first time, every time, or, you know, one ring in our call center, and they actually talk to someone right away and get resolution. So the foundation is built on two levels. One, the footing, the strategic choice to be the best. And secondly, above the footing is the foundation itself which is a supportive infrastructure, right methods, tools, and metrics. And when you make the decision to do these, you then have to focus them on something. And one of the first places to focus them on are what we consider to be enablers. In other words, most of us have some form of design and development of new services organization should have some form of a enterprise quality assurance, quality control, quality management system, and you probably have some continuous improvement program. If you do not have them in the way I describe them, then you are probably going to begin by creating new continuous improvement program, new design program, and maybe modify or start your quality management system. Typically, when you're in an organization, it may already have a quality assurance system focused on product quality. Once you make the strategic choice to be the best, you want to start expanding that system across the organization to not just the products, not just the services, but all the processes that we work on every day that are going to drive that experience. We expand the term quality management system to enterprise quality management system to connote the knowledge that you must have from supplier to customer if you're manufacturing or supplier of information to customer satisfaction if you're a service. Secondly, you need to beef up your continuous improvement program by making sure it's doing what you want it to do. So many times uh, the methods of Six Sigma or root cause analysis are always at how do we reduce the cost. When we talk about breakthrough improvement and continuous improvement in Duran's eyes, we're talking about focusing on quality in the eyes of the customer. What's going to make them satisfied, not dissatisfied? And that comes in two ways. One, do we have the right products that the customers want? And that could be a service or a physical good. Uh, could be insurance policy or it could be a meal or it could be a surgery, or it could be a new set of braces. So one aspect of quality means we have the right features that satisfy the customer. Another aspect is that those features are delivered efficiently and effectively every time. When there's rework or warranty problems or scrap that we have to pay for, that gets passed off into the customer in terms of lower value. So one of the enablers that you need to think about is how do we focus on breakthrough improvement to really dramatically change how we decrease dissatisfaction. And at the same time, how do we design new features that are gonna meet the customer need? If these three things look familiar, it's part of Duran's quality trilogy, the universal processes that apply to any organization. You must have design 
and planning process, processes that will meet and exceed the customer and business need. You need a quality assurance system to make sure whatever we design in is maintained and we perform to what we designed. And over time, continuously improve and drive those improvements to meet the ever-changing needs of the customer. The second part of the enablers is that workforce thing, that you need to engage the workforce and many leaders want them to be accountable. But you can't be accountable for something you don't control. You can't be accountable for something you didn't design. You can't be accountable if you don't give us the tools to do breakthrough improvement. So in parallel with the universal principles, we have to establish the means for employee engagement, getting people together to actually work on new designs, to work on improvement, to work on the quality assurance system, and they need to have the knowledge to do that. So you have to have some form of talent and skill development. If you can get the universal principles and those methods that come with it, and you get the mechanisms to get employees engaged, and you educate them and teach them, they will be accountable. But you can't shoot for accountability until you give them that. So in other words, we want to implement a Lean Six Sigma program. And most of Lean Six Sigma, the DMAIC side, is breakthrough improvement. If we want to start a Lean Six Sigma program, we've made a decision that's the method, define, measure, analyze, improve, control, project by project, and we need champions and leaders. So we need to train leaders, we need to train champions, and we need to have some teams. So we get those employees engaged, we got to teach them to do it. we got to give them time to do it. We have to make them part of the infrastructure to do it. And so as we improve design and breakthrough improvement, we engage the employees through continuous skill development, project completion, and then we maintain our solutions with our insurance system, you're gonna get accountable workforce. But you can't hold me accountable for something I don't know. Now, one of the reasons why accountability of workforce is, peril is, is next to the enterprise quality management system, it's really simple. There's two aspects, aspects of your quality management system. One is how is the system meeting our customer requirements and how is the system creating an accountable workforce? Well, it does that by providing metrics, monitoring, uh, process control, employee control, and self-control. And so if we have the employees in a state of self-control, our processes are in a state of control, the system's in a state of control. And what you end up having is a very strong foundation that's gonna enable this to take place. Now, we don't see results until we get these in place. So let's just take that first day, first day we begin. Leadership says we wanna be the best. We go out and we research the methodologies, the structures, and the tools. We decide we're gonna do uh, Lean Six Sigma. So what do we have to do? We got to focus on improvement. We got to have projects. In order to have projects, we have to have leadership involvement. Leadership needs to have some education on how to do that. It's different from what they're doing. We give the leadership some education. They realize they're responsible to pick projects, set goals, pick projects. They pick champions. And now we put those champions together with employees. We train them and we launch those projects. And we repeat that over and over again. And as we're improving the projects, the processes are getting better. When the projects are done, that C in DMAIC means control. We make sure that we change any controls in our quality management system. We may have done breakthrough improvement in the finance process or a service process that never had quality management. Well, the outcome of that project should be some form of assurance built into the quality assurance program. Likewise, if you already have a quality assurance program and you continue and you begin an improvement program like Lean Six Sigma, you want to always adjust your quality assurance system to reflect any changes. So, and over time, everything is over time. We build the foundation over time. We build our enablers over time. You will then get to a point where your products, which we always say begin with a product so the customer can see the change first, or the business can see a reduction in the cost of poor quality first, 
that enables you to then really focus on processes that are behind the scenes and get better at your data quality. And that will start to all drive a great customer experience. And so the results you see tend to fall in this order, product, process, experience. And it makes sense because think about it. We can't just change the customer experience if their product or service isn't meeting their needs. We have to work on that. We can't improve their experience by reducing the cost and making our process more efficient unless we're going to drive past that cost onto the customer. In other words, lower the price, which most businesses don't usually do. So we want to make sure that we focus on breakthrough improvement of product and process, uh, get that in control, and then start to look at new designs, better products and service features, which will drive, then drive new products and then drive better processes and better customer experience. And as we build our levels in our organization, we're going to find that we're starting to see an increase in sales, an increase in our performance to cost. We say optimal cost because you're never going to drive costs down to zero, although some organizations like to. They're never going to get there. But better cost systems in place, better efficiencies, less waste, you're going to get better uh, profitability from increasing sales and lowering costs. And of course, those great customer experiences are going to turn into loyal customers. So you see each layer of this house, and we could have called it a layer cake, but each layer of this house is going to get us to the end result. But if you take one piece out, it's not going to fall apart, but it's just not going to be the best house. It's not going to be a dream house. So for instance, let's strip away everything except efficient processes. Let's just have a strategic choice to be the, the lowest cost provider. And we have a simple infrastructure and tools of cost reduction aimed at continuously improving processes to drive out costs. That is going to get us cost excellence, but it's probably going to cost us customer experience and sales. Why? Because many times we take costs out of a process without truly understanding the impact on the customer, and we may remove features that the customer actually wanted and liked. And by removing the features, you no longer meet their need. They decide to go elsewhere. Another scenario about weakness in excellence and weakness in our home is an organization that focuses just on innovation and design. We want to be the design leader. We create these great designs. They are superior products. But what we find is that the processes that have to carry them out may not be capable. And the organization then has, has the problem with meeting customer requirements and customer experience. So you create disloyalty or you create excess costs to correct it. And you may have great sales that you can't scale up to. So in other words, if you pick and choose what you want to be, you're going to have a weakness in the home. If your home is weak now, you can fill in the blanks. But if you haven't started yet or you feel your home is weak, layer it layer by layer. I've seen organizations go from the foundation to the top in weeks because of what they focused on. Large organizations may take years. When you finally have your system in place, you've been out there 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, three years, the house is now structurally sound. You may have gotten benefit from the first week. You may have gotten benefit from the first month, but you don't get culture change until you've been at it long enough. I've used this um, number with my clients based on my own experience. When one in four people have been involved in some form of excellence engagement, quality improvement team, process improvement team, a design team, been engaged in rapid improvement event, Kaizen, one in four people, you're going to start to go and ramp up faster. To get to that first 25%, is like planting seeds and watering those seeds. I heard a story the other day about a plant that you plant it and it takes five months to see the first sprout. But once you see the first sprout, it doubles every 90 days. So it's similar to that. 
but that should not be something that scares you away. The goal of excellence takes time. To get increased sales, reduced costs can happen rather quickly. So as you think about building your organizational culture of excellence, you need to think about it in this way. Now I'd like to pause because we have a bunch of questions here and I'd like to then come back to my final slide. So Dave, what do we got here? Dave? I, I... I am fumbling here because I don't see them on my screen, Joe. They, uh, so you have to read them. <laughs> okay, I got one here. Good. So um, what's the difference between quality, excellence, and culture of excellence? Uh, and really, in, in the Duran eyes, nothing if you define quality as a big Q. In other words, quality in the sense of enterprise quality, quality in the sense of culture of excellence. But I believe you're referring to the question of little Q versus culture of excellence. And therefore, managing for product quality is not the same as managing for enterprise quality. Culture of excellence means for managing across the entire organization. What do you think, Dave? I don't see any other questions yet, Joe, but I have a lot in my own mind. Is there anything else you're seeing on your screen? Yeah, so let's first ask everybody, do you want to send us some questions? You're welcome to do that. Uh, if not, I have one more. Uh, the question is, when are all the people on this screen going to send me a question? And <laughs> I, hope it's, I hope it's right now. But in any case, I'd like to continue on. And yes. uh, let's just get to the end. I said this session was going to be about 35 minutes long, and right now it's at 31. Uh, so, a couple of things. One, uh, if you're going to build your house, if you're going to go backwards, there we go. If you're going to build a, a culture of excellence, you need to pick and choose words that resonate with your organization. For instance, many uh, lean practitioners use the Shingo framework for operational excellence. Many Baldridge experts use the Baldridge framework. There's nothing wrong with that. The difference is make sure that if you're truly looking for a culture of excellence, you apply that across the organization. You can't be excellent by just having great operational excellence in manufacturing. You can't be just excellence by having um, applied only four of the six pillars of Baldridge or EFQM or whatever you're looking at. What's really important here is that you think about your framework in a way that allows you to build a structured system over time. Because one of the things that this does is as your culture begins to create a habit of excellence, you're gonna find that you're always going to be revisiting this house. In the same way we add new rooms on, we repaint them, we get new technology, we update things. So it's not a static, uh, framework. It's a, just like a home, it's going to need some care, loving, and change over time. If you, oh. yes, sir? Yeah, let me throw a, a, a lob, a large question out, because I'm looking at the bottom of the house, the foundation, and it says a choice to be the best. The question is, can we count on today's leaders in any type of organization who make that choice to stick with it? It seems that their consistency and their constant attention is the key to all the rest happening. And we know also that leadership tends to change fairly rapidly these days. So let me ask that you to reflect on the importance of strong, consistent leaders who really mean it when they commit to being the best? Well, it's a, it's a very valid point. And if you're in corporate America particularly, and there's a three-year uh, engagement of leadership at the top, there's this constant revolving door. Your chances of ever attaining a culture of excellence are weak.
But in the case where you've got an organization that is actually nurturing the organization to be excellent, mm -hmm. there's a very good handoff between leaders of one generation to the next. However, each leader always wants to put their own slant on it. So for instance, I sell my house, I give it to a new leader, that leader is gonna change the colors, that leader might change the walls, that leader might add a room. So every leader wants to change it somewhat. And I'm gonna put those into two buckets. Some wanna change it because they think the prior leadership wasn't getting the most out of the program. Mm -hmm. Others wanna change it to make it to a new level of performance. It's that latter one that we like, the one that wanna get it to a new level of performance. But sometimes people take it down a notch by thinking it's not performing and they want to abandon it. Mm -hmm. um, so they knock the house down and build a new house up. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a real bright answer, but I can give you a one stat that no organization ever attained excellence without the active involvement and support of leadership, period. Yep. You can get improvements, you can get lean, you can get results, you can get price conscious, but you're never going to get to that level without it. And if it, you know, if it takes you five years and you only have leaders changing every three years, leadership does have to have a, you know, there is a change going on in the organization as they see the results, they're going to want to keep doing it. So what, what, what creates a new breed of leaders is the benefit of those champions moving their way up. They get to the level. I think one of the reasons why many organizations today even want to think about this because you know, when I started out 30 years ago, we were all rookies. A lot of mm -hmm. those rookies are now in senior positions and they realize that that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is keep it going. So I would uh, say that would be my answer. Okay. Okay, so uh, folks, if you are interested in receiving a certificate of completion by attending all seven sessions, uh, you're welcome to do so. You just send us an email. And at the end, we'll tell you what you have to do to do that. If you've missed one, you can go online and watch it. Uh, but we're going to have a little exercise at the end of all these for you to get your certificate of completion. Also, we have a great uh, online coaching and learning platform called Impro. Uh, it consists of an improvement community of practitioners. It consists of a uh, knowledge base where you can kind of like the Qualipedia or the Wikipedia of excellence. And it also has an online learning and coaching program. Uh, we also are kicking off a whole new breed of uh, workshops. You know, we used to have over a hundred different workshops and we found that people get overwhelmed. So we, we picked the best of the best. And of course, green belts, black belts and upgrade to black belt are out there, but our, our lean and root cause corrective action workshops are beginning. Uh, they're online and they also consist of a live uh, presenter like we're doing here for a number of sessions. So I am actually the, the leader of the Root Cause Corrective Action one starting on July 25th. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about Root Cause Corrective Action and you'd like to get a certification in that, uh, please sign up. You can uh, contact me directly at that email or just click on the sign up here and you'll find us. And I encourage you all to uh, come back at the next session in a couple weeks where we will dump, jump right into the foundation. So I'd like to keep my word and keep this about 40 minutes or less. So thank you for your time and we'll see you again. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone. Look forward to next month.